Hello, Bartłomiej Radziejewski. I'm the director of uh, Nova Confederacja, a think tank and magazine based in Poland. And today we are hosting a living legend, one of the greatest, most famous political thinkers in the world, political scientists in the world, Professor John Melsheimer. Welcome. Thank you for being with us. It's a great honor. Professor, uh, in uh, 2001, you were right predicting uh, the great challenge of the rise of China. You were not listened to. You were also right predicting terrible costs of the policy of spreading democracy around the world. You were also not listened to. Uh, you were also uh, right predicting the NATO crisis. And you were also not listened to. How it is like to be right and not <laughs> listen to on world politics? Uh, it's somewhat depressing, uh, but uh, it is often the case with social scientists, with scholars, that you come up with arguments that are not politically popular. And uh, you make those arguments, and people listen to you, but in a sense it goes in one ear and out the other ear, and you have no effect on how people think. Uh, and how people act. And I think inside the United States, uh, I, I've often made arguments that people disagreed with. And in some cases, not every case, uh, I've proved right. Thanks to the great work of uh, Jan Sankiewicz and uh, Universitas uh, Printing House, uh, your book, The Strategy of Great Power Politics, uh, has been finally, finally translated into Polish. Uh, what uh, the tragedy, tragedy of great politics is? My basic argument is that because of the structure of the international system, uh, because of the architecture of the international system, states, and we're talking mainly about great powers here, have no choice but to try to gain power at the advantage of other great powers. And what exactly do I mean when I say the structure of the international system is what causes this kind of aggressive behavior? Because we live in a world where there's no higher authority that sits above states, and because you can never know the intentions of other states, it's very important for the great powers to do everything they can to be as powerful as possible. Why is that the case? Because if you get into trouble, there's no higher authority that can come down and rescue you. And furthermore, if you're a great power and I'm a great power, I can never know what your intentions will be in the future and you can never know what my intentions will be in the future. And there's always the danger that you will have malign or evil intentions towards me, or I will have malign or evil intentions towards you. And if one of us has malign intentions and goes after the other, again, there's no higher authority that you can turn to. So the best way for you to protect yourself is to be much more powerful than me, because then I really can't threaten you. The best way for me to protect myself against you, you're another state in this story, is for me to be much more powerful than you. So what happens then is you and I, these two different states, compete with each other for power. One wants to be more powerful than the other. And this is the basic logic that drives international politics. It's the notion that the best way to survive the best way to be secure in international politics, in a world where there's no higher authority, is to be really powerful. And Poland is a good example of how this basic logic works. Poland's big problem over the past few centuries is that it was very small. It didn't have a lot of population, it didn't have a big population, it didn't have a lot of people, and it did not have a lot of wealth. It was surrounded by countries like Germany and Russia and Austria that were much more powerful. And those countries gobbled up Poland. 
Poland disappeared from the map from 1795 to 1918, as you know better than I do, because I it was small and weak. Poland would have been much better off if it had been really powerful. Poland would have been much better off if it was by far the most powerful state in Europe. So again, this shows you very clearly that the best way to survive is to be really powerful. What you want to do is you want to look like the United States in the Western Hemisphere. No Americans go to bed at night worrying about Canada or Mexico attacking the United States or Guatemala or Brazil. Why is that the case? It is because we are so big and so powerful. That is the best way to survive in international politics. One of the basic assumptions here is uh, that the international system is uh, anarchic. Uh, but uh, uh, um, it has uh, dire consequences, uh, inter alia making states aggressive, power greedy, you describe it. Uh, but after the Cold War we had a unipolar moment uh, with only one superpower dominating the system and delivering a relative uh, stability to most of the world uh, for quite a long time. It means that the system was uh, hierarchical, not anarchical. And uh, it contradicts your theory, doesn't it? I actually don't think that the world was hierarchical. I think that there's no question that in the unipolar moment there was one country on the planet the United States of America, that was much more powerful than every other country. But China remained a sovereign state. Russia remained a sovereign state. Poland remained a sovereign state. The state system was still in existence. The distribution of power in unipolarity was surely very different than it was during the Cold War when we had a bipolar distribution of power. But there was still no higher authority that sat above those states. If you had gone to Beijing or you had gone to Moscow in 2000 and said, is the United States the higher authority that determines how international politics should work, they would have said, absolutely no. They would have said, we are sovereign states. At the same time, they would surely have recognized that the United States was the most powerful state on the planet. So we were in a unipolar world, but it was still an anarchic world. It was not hierarchic in the sense that there was a governing authority that sat above states. Mm -hmm. You were uh, uh, also one of the famous critics of the NATO enlargements. Uh, Please tell us why, as it is a very important matter for us in Poland. Well, I thought that when the Cold War ended, it was very important not to antagonize the Soviet Union and then after 1991, Russia. Um, it was quite clear to me that Russia, the remnant state, the principal remnant state left over from the Soviet Union, was going to be nowhere near as powerful as the Soviet Union was and was not a threat to the West the way the Soviet Union was. So that it made good sense for the United States not to provoke Russia and end up in a security competition with Russia. Uh, now, most people don't realize this, but when the Cold War ended, the Soviet Union wanted the United States to stay in Europe and the Soviet Union wanted NATO to remain intact. Very important to understand that. And you want to ask yourself the question, why? And the answer is, the Soviets saw the American presence and NATO as a way of keeping the Germans down. The Soviets understood that once they left Eastern Europe, once the Warsaw Pact disintegrated, you would have German unification. And not surprisingly, the Soviets worried about what the implications of German unification would mean, given the history of the 20th century, World War I, World War II. So they wanted the Americans to stay. 
But what the Soviets did not want was NATO expansion. They did not want this military alliance that had been a mortal foe of the Soviet Union moving up to the Soviet Union's borders. And of course, later, that's Russia's borders. And not long after the Cold War ends and the Soviet Union collapses in the mid-1990s, the Clinton administration announces that NATO is going to move eastward. And we effectively op adopt an open-door policy, which says that virtually every country in Eastern Europe, including countries that are right on Russia's borders, uh, are welcome to join NATO and welcome to join the European Union and effectively to become part of the West, which means that these countries will become Western bulwarks right on Russia's borders. This is what NATO expansion is ultimately going to lead to. From a realist point of view, this is a prescription for disaster because no great power is going to allow a military alliance run by another great power to march right up to its borders. Now, the United States got away with expansion in 1999 when, of course, Poland was brought into the alliance. And then we got away with another tranche of expansion in 2004. But the real trouble started after the April 2008 Bucharest summit, uh, NATO Bucharest summit, 2008, April 2008, where it was said afterwards that both Georgia and Ukraine would become part of NATO. The Russians said at the time that is categorically unacceptable. And it's no surprise that in August of 2008, you had a war involving Georgia and Russia. And then in February 2014, a major crisis broke out over Ukraine. The Russians are not going to allow either Georgia or Ukraine to become part of NATO or to become, more generally, Western bulwarks on their border. So I believe that NATO expansion has ultimately led to a crisis between Russia on one hand and the West on the other. But let us be clear about uh, NATO enlargement in the 90s. Uh, uh, are you claiming that uh, it was a mistake, expansion to the Central Eastern Europe? Well, we were able to get away with NATO expansion in 1999, and we were able to get away with expansion in 2004. Ukraine and Georgia in 2008, when we began to move uh, to push for expansion in 2004, uh, that was, uh, that was the, the fundamental mistake. That was a bridge too far. I was not in favor of any NATO expansion at all, to include the 99 expansion and the 2004 expansion. Uh, and that's in large part because I did not view Russia as a serious threat. Uh, in your recent book, uh, you make a frontal attack on political liberalism. You dislike liberals, don't you? No. I, I love liberalism as... Uh, Sorry, we are talking about the book called The Great Delusion. Yes. I, I dislike liberal foreign policy. I do not dislike liberalism as a political system. I thank my lucky stars every day that I was born in the United States of America, which is a liberal democracy. I think liberal democracy is the best political system on the planet. And I think it would be good if every country was a liberal democracy. However, I do not think that adopting a foreign policy that calls for spreading liberal democracy all around the world is smart. I think that liberal foreign policy, we call it liberal hegemony in the United States, the idea that you're going to spread liberal democracy here, there, and everywhere is a prescription for disaster. And I believe the United States has got itself into huge trouble in the greater Middle East by trying to spread liberal democracy into that area of the world. So I'm in favor of liberal democracy as a political system inside different countries. 
including the United States, obviously. But I'm not in favor of a liberal foreign policy that calls for spreading liberal democracy, especially at the end of a rifle barrel. But uh, many uh, liberal thinkers uh, assume that uh, liberal democracies do not fight each other. So uh, why do you think uh, it, the spre spreading of democracy will lead to disaster? Well, there's no question there's a consensus among uh, liberal IR thinkers in the United States that liberal democracies don't fight each other. I don't agree with that, but why? Well, because I think that there is evidence that liberal democracies have fought against each other. Mm -hmm. There are a handful of cases out there, and I think there's not a good logic that underpins that argument. But l let's just assume for the moment that I accept the argument that liberal democracies don't fight each other. The question then becomes, do I, in turn, support the argument that we should therefore try to spread liberal democracy around the planet so that we can create a peaceful world. The problem with that is that spreading liberal democracy is very difficult to do. And it's especially difficult to do when you invade other countries because we live in the age of nationalism and countries do not like other countries telling them how to organize their politics. So when the United States invades Iraq and invades Afghanistan and talks about invading other countries in the greater Middle East, all for the purposes of creating a sea of democracies in that region of the world, it's going to get itself into big trouble because it's going to run up against nationalism. And this is exactly what's happened in Afghanistan, and it's exactly what's happened in Iraq. The Iraqis don't want us telling them what their political system should look like, nor do the Afghanis. The evidence on this is quite clear, that spreading democracy at the end of a rifle barrel is very hard to do and ends up causing enormous trouble for the country that tries to execute that policy. And this is what's happened to the United States. So my point to you is, even if you believe that liberal democracies don't fight each other, and again, I don't believe that, right? But if you do believe that, it does not make sense to work overtime to try and spread liberal democracy because you end up getting yourself into a heap of trouble. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much for being with us for these very interesting uh, answers. My pleasure.